on an ordinary street in an ordinary house. One man is getting ready for his day. Nice towel. Lovely. He likes a blow dry then. Hang on a minute. Is he drying his face? Oh, yes. Check this out. Meet Jesus Acaves. He has an amazing body. Jesus has over 60,000 hairs on his face. This is no more than the average man, but whereas we will have tiny, fine facial hairs, incredibly, Jesus's hairs are long and dark, like the hair on his head. So what makes his amazing body like this? Well, Jesus has had his hairy face since birth, and it's down to a genetic condition called hypertrichosis. Before we're born, we're all covered with a layer of fine hair, which normally disappears about a month before we burst out. But hypertrichosis means the hair continues to grow in unexpected places. His furry face keeps him toasty warm in winter. And come summertime, he treats his luscious locks to a trim to keep himself cool. Jesus is one of only 50 people in the world who have super hairy faces. Now that's amazing. We've got some incredible body tricks for you to show your friends. Want to find out how you can stop your mates from simply picking up something off the floor? We're going to show you. Zan, to do this trick, I'm going to need some money. Oh, all right. But it's my lunch money. I'm going to need it back. Well, I tell you what, Zan, you can have it back if you can pick it up off the floor. If you don't pick it up, I get it. Sounds quite easy. Got it. That was a rubbish trick. Who thinks that was a rubbish trick? Me! Yeah! All right, Zan, well, we'll do it again. This time, you won't be able to pick up the money. So go and stand against the wall. And now, keeping your feet where they are, I just want you to bend down and pick up the money. Come on, Zan, pick it up. Chris, what have you done? Ah, I can't get it. That's hard. So it looks like I get the lunch money, doesn't it? Come on, then. Let's see if anyone else can do it. He can't. <laughs> she definitely can't. So why can't anyone, including Zand, pick up the money? <laughs> when you bend over, your bum pushes back, and the wall's stopping it from pushing back. George has got it. Normally, when you bend over to pick something up, your body will adjust itself backwards in order to balance it out. So when your body's flat against the wall, you can't go backwards, and there's no chance of picking up that money. All you can do is fall forwards. So I'm going to need the money back from all of you guys. Give me my money back! Come on, Zand! Now to our lab, Whoa. where we do incredible experiments. Oh, looks disgusting. To show you how your body works. So watch this. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Vomit. What makes our bodies do it and why? Well, we're doctors and we can tell you. Can I get it now? Hang on. Being sick is your body's mechanism for getting rid of stuff it doesn't want, often because there's a bad bacteria or virus in your stomach. So that's the simple answer to why we puke, although it's a bit more complicated. Now can I get it? Hang on. But what's vomit actually made of? And what goes on inside our bodies to prepare us for this massive event? Now can I get it? Oh, go on, then. Let's eat Chris's lunch. This is my sick. Oh. Chris, that's awful. Don't worry, I'm not ill. There is still food in there. That's because when you're sick from your stomach, it's not choosy. You bring up everything to try and get rid of that bad bacteria or virus. So what your stomach ejects is all the food and drink you've taken in, in one go. But there is another ingredient in vomit. Azanda, I want you to close your eyes and imagine you're in a really posh Italian restaurant. Now, don't you think my vomit smells a bit like cheese? cheese.
And that's because when food is broken down in your stomach, it makes butyric acid. The acid is produced by bacteria as it eats away at your food, and the same bacterial process occurs as cheese ages. Which is why older cheeses like Parmesan smell a little bit like vomit. Just as well Chris hadn't been eating Parmesan or his vomit would smell much worse. Enough already. Now, I've got something even better than a tub of my own vomit. Apart from it being really unpleasant when you're sick, there are real dangers of your vomit spreading a virus. And it can lead to an epidemic, just like the winter vomiting bug, norovirus. But how can vomit spread viruses? This is Larry. He's a robot, but he's not just any old robot, he's a vomiting robot. Larry's been specially designed to show us how the virus can spread to other people when we vomit. So, I've given Larry a big drink and he's going to vomit into this container. If he's ill, shouldn't he just stick to dry toast or something? Zond! Ready to puke in three, two, one! <laughs> that was really powerful. It's amazing. That might look like a much more powerful puke than a human would do, but in fact there are things like norovirus that do make you projectile vomit. It's lucky we had such a big container. I think we've caught it all. Well, we can check that, Zahn, because I put a fluorescent dye in the liquid that I made Larry drink. Do you think that's what made him sick? Hmm. No, I think turning the knob made him sick. He's a robot, Zand. So, I'm going to go and turn on the ultraviolet lights and we'll see if any of the splashes of vomit escaped. So, there's loads in the container. You can see it really well. You look outside the container, see how much there is here. Yeah, there's loads. And then over here where I am, there's even more. These are big, big drops. Some of them are more than two metres away from Larry. Look, Zand, it's even on you. Oh, yeah. It's all over me. It's just amazing how much mess he's made. Well, this is exactly why Larry was invented, to show just how far drops of vomit can spread. And remember, each one of these splashes has enough virus in it to make you seriously ill. So remember, if you're being sick yourself or you're looking after someone who's sick, it's really important to wash the whole area really carefully and wash your hands with soap and water to stop spreading the virus on. But it's not all bad news. Vomiting can sometimes be your way of getting rid of things that are harmful. This never would have happened if we'd just given him dry toast. Ouch. Meet the Bod Pod. No, I'm not being sent into space. With the help of Dr Philip McTurnan, this cool bit of kit is going to measure how much fat I have on my body. OK, so what do I do? Just get in it? No. There's one thing that you need to do first. You need to make sure that we have something that uh, is much tighter than this. Well, luckily, I'm wearing my Operation Ouch leotard. You might be wondering why I've agreed to wear this, but the pod needs to take very precise measurements, so baggy clothing and loose hair are no good. This device works by measuring the amount of room my body takes up in this enclosed space. It feels very claustrophobic. Luckily, I've got a nice big window so I can see. And a few fancy computer calculations later, we have my stats. There we go. Percentage fat, 13.8%. That's very good. It means, you know, you're fit, healthy, and you've got the right, right amount of fat, that's for sure. So if I'm 13.8% body fat, how much fat is there on me? And to give you an idea, this is standard cooking oil. Mm -hmm. But if you had 12 bottles of this, this would equate to how much fat you have in your body. This is a really nice illustration of how amazing fat is as an energy store. I have 12 bottles of fat like this in my body, and that's enough energy for me to run 30 marathons. And it also explains why fat is so hard to get rid of, because you've got to do a huge amount of work to get rid of a relatively small amount of fat. So more exercise will get rid of it, but to understand why too much fat can be bad, we need to get a closer look. I'm about to have a fat biopsy, and that's when some fat is taken out of my tummy using a huge needle. Now, obviously, Zand and I aren't afraid of big needles, but if you're squeamish, you need to turn off the television, leave the room, and go and hide under your bed. Done that? Good. Dr Milan, show us the needle. I told you it was big. Zand! Where's Zahn? Zahn said he'd do this. Too late. I've had a local anaesthetic, so I can't feel anything. 
and the doctor's cut a little hole in my tummy so that he can get that huge needle in and some of my fat out. Oh, wow, yeah. So this yellow stuff floating on the top here, this is the fat from my tummy. And the average person has 50 billion fat cells, more fat cells than there are people on the planet. Now, it may look like we've used a huge needle and not got very much fat, but we don't need that much because we're going to have a look at some fat up close under the microscope. So let's see what the cells actually look like. These are my fat cells, and these belong to a person who has a higher fat content in their body. Why are their cells looking different to mine? We can see from here you have a lot smaller fat cells. Now, someone who has more weight, they have bigger fat cells. So a person with more fat doesn't necessarily have more cells, they've just got more fat in each cell. Yes, so eventually the fat spills over and then what happens is you can get fat in your liver, you can get it in your heart, which affects how they function and how your body functions as a whole. So although body fat is vital to life because it's where the energy from the food we eat is stored, it's really important we have the right amount of it. Too much of it can put you at risk of conditions like heart disease and cancer. So I, for one, am going to keep up with my exercise. I must get Zand one of these leotards. No chance. Ouch. Earlier, Mason came to accident and emergency after injuring his ankle. Let's catch up with him. Back in Sheffield, eight-year-old Mason is in with a badly swollen ankle. Mason was trampolining and jumping as high as he could, but his cousin was on the same trampoline. They smashed into each other, toppled down, and Mason twisted his ankle. Ouch! Dr Beavis has x-rayed Mason's foot and has seen a small fracture. Mason's going to need to have a plaster cast on for a few weeks, so why is he so happy? Got what I wanted. Crutches. But before he can get them, he needs to prove he can use them. First, he needs to get his plaster cast on. I'm never going on a trampoline ever again. Really, Mason? Can't imagine why. Ooh, that's nice. Ooh, I think he's enjoying this, Chris. Oh, I can feel it setting already. All done. Mason's quite young for crutches, hence the test. You getting me crutches now? Yeah, but it all depends on if you can work them. Because she says you're a bit little, but because yeah. she's so tall, you're going to try. The moment of truth has arrived. It certainly has, Zand. Hey. Okay. Mason needs to show the nurse that he can get about on the crutches without falling over. Just do it. He's styling it. Success. <laughs> so, armed with his new crutches, Mason speeds off, ready to impress the girls. Was there ever any doubt in your mind? A little wobble, but not major. And what has he learned? Don't never try and do as high as you can on a trampoline, because that's what happens. Careful, Mason. A bit stumbly, but off we go. Bye. This is a tiny camera. I'm going to look inside Chris's head with it. Now, you must never put anything in your ears or you could cause permanent damage. We can only do this because we're doctors. Oh, that's great. That is Chris's eardrum. Lovely. OK, Chris, what I want you to do is close your mouth, plug your nose, and now blow out gently. Oh, that's really good. That's lovely. So what you can see there is Chris's eardrum bulging. Now, the eardrum is a very thin membrane which acts like a drum. That's why it's called the eardrum. It vibrates when sound waves hit it, but it has another important job. It protects the very delicate middle and inner ears behind it. But there's something else lurking inside your ears that we want to show you. Tell you what's on, give me the camera and I'll have a look at your ears. <laughs> Can you see that gooey, yellow, browny, crumbly stuff? That is Zahn's earwax. How much do I have? A lot more than me. That's great, because earwax is in our ears for a good reason. But what is earwax? And why do we have it? Well, we're going to show you. Yep, I can see right through to the other side. What? Really? Well, how many fingers am I holding up, then? Three. Wow. 
didn't think that was medically possible. Now look, that is a good sample of your earwax. It's not pretty to look at, but it is brilliant stuff. Earwax is actually a type of sweat. Some people get more than others, just like some people sweat more than others, but everyone has it. When the earwax is produced in your ear canal, it's runny, but it dries out as it works its way out of your ear. This takes about a month, and it's helped along by you yawning, chewing, chatting, until it flakes out of your ear naturally. So next time you get told off for chatting in class, you could always say you're trying to work out your earwax. Zond, what are you doing? I was just tasting it. I can see that, but why? I guess I just wanted to know what it tasted like. Well, what does it taste like? Actually, it's not very nice. It's very bitter. And that's because earwax is made up of around 40 different substances. The main ones are fatty acids and cholesterol, and none of them taste very nice. Plus the fact that it's been in your ear for about the last month. Anyway, now we know what's in earwax, what's it for? Well, to show you, I've got a model of Zahn's ear. There we go, Zond. Whoa! It's amazing. Hello? Hello? It even sounds like me. Anyway, in the air around us, there are lots of particles of dust and bugs and other stuff. So for this experiment, I'm going to need some giant particles to go with Zond's giant ear. But as we don't have any giant bugs or dirt to go with the giant ear, these polystyrene balls will have to do. Now, when air passes around us, some of these dirt or bug particles could get into our ears. Watch. With everything else supersized, we thought we'd go for a supersized gust of wind too. Here it goes. <laughs> See how many went through the hole? If this was a real ear, all the dust and dirt particles that went through would have clogged up the eardrum and damaged the inner ear behind it. So here's the only problem with this otherwise amazing model. It doesn't have any earwax. So let's smear an earwax-type gunk in there and see what happens. We're coating the big ear with a layer of sticky yellow stuff, a bit like the wax in your ear, and you'll see how it protects your delicate eardrum and the inner ear behind it. Ready? Here we go again. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Look, loads of them have stuck in there. So that's what happens every day in your ears. Any unwanted specks of dirt or bugs that get blown near your ears get stuck in your earwax and then moved out of your ear. Which means your eardrum and everything behind it stays safe. The other great thing about your earwax is that the acid in it deters bacteria too, so it keeps infection out. So although it might taste horrible to Zand, it also tastes horrible for bugs.